From the Samira Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO and Mod, where we bring together the world's foremost experts, the doctors dedicated to studying it, and the patients who live with it every day. With support from Genetech. Hello and welcome back for another episode. Our episodes are presented to help people better understand NMO and MOV. For some of us, these terms are used interchangeably, but as we will see, there is power in labels and definitions. Today we're going to be talking about double seronegative NMO. Historically, NMO dates back to the 1800s when Dr. Devick described people who were suffering from both optic neuritis and spinal inflammation. Now these people were often labeled as having MS. However, over the next century, science evolved and researchers discovered the AQP4 antibody. NMO was truly defined when the international diagnostic criteria were published. The next evolution was identifying MOG antibodies and establishing its own diagnostic criteria. But within the NMO and MOG community, a population of people present with the signs and symptoms of those diseases but have tested negative for both antibodies. These people are double seronegative. To help us learn more, we're going to be joined by three guests to help us look at all sides of double seronegative NMO. Our first guest is Nicole Hilton of Tennessee. Welcome, Nicole. I appreciate you joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, so um, I'm a 51-year-old mother of five with two grandchildren, um, which in and of itself makes your life very, very hectic. Uh, we're very active in church and we run a homeless ministry, my husband and I do. We teach recovery classes, um, jail ministry, all the aspects of that. So between kids activities and taking care of grandchildren and working and running the ministry life it was always very chaotic on the go from five in the morning till midnight most days and just going and loving life and things were great. And then this happened. <laughs> it's been slowly taking chunks away. Can you tell us more about how it all started? Sure. So in 2015, I had the first bout of optic neuritis. Um, I woke up one morning and just couldn't see out of my left eye. Um, it wasn't completely black, but it was pretty close to it. And so I quick called my eye doctor. I have terrible eyesight to begin with. Um, I had toxoplasmosis, retinal toxoplasmosis 27 years ago. So my doctor knows me very well, keeps very good tabs on me. So when I called him and said, Hey, Dr. K, I can't see. He said, well, come here. <laughs> so I went straight to him and he, um, did, I believe it was like an ultrasound of the back of my eye. And he said, your nerves are so inflamed and so upset. He said, this is optic neuritis. He said, so we're going to do steroids. So I did oral steroids and topical steroids um, drops in my eyes. Did that for 10 days. And gradually my vision came back pretty well. Um, we caught it really, really early. Dealt with it really early. And it just, it came back pretty quick with the oral steroids and stuff. Um, not fully, but for the most part. And then that happened like three more times over the next year and a half. And he sat me down and he said, you know, this doesn't happen unless you have MS. You don't get optic neuritis unless you have MS. You need to go get checked for MS. And he kept preaching it at me. Well, I worked for neurology. So I said, hey, listen, my eye doctor is saying I keep having all these optic neuritis things that I probably have MS. So um, they did a lumbar puncture and evoke potential MRIs, all sorts of stuff. And I did not have any signs. I didn't have any spinal lesions. I didn't have any of the O-bands in the spinal fluid. There wasn't any evidence of MS. So they said, no, that's not it. It's just a freak thing because you're weird. About a year later, um, I started having numbness and weakness in my left leg. And it would last for a month or two. And it would get real weak. And it would feel like it was cold water running through it. And it would also feel like burning needles. It was just the weirdest sensation. Um, and I deal with it for a little while. They'd give me a steroid pack, said, you know, something's inflamed. Maybe you've got a pinched nerve, tried spinal injections, all the things, and it would go away. And a few months later, it would come back. And I did this for a while. We repeated the lumbar puncture and the MRIs um, in 2020. And the myelin proteins, there's a level. It's where your myelin proteins are supposed to be. And mine were at the, like right at the, the very top number. 
where they were non-existent before. Um, so there was that evidence and I had a small lesion on my brain. Um, so they said, well, something's going on, but you don't really fit in any box. So we're just gonna treat the symptoms. So I had the gabapentin and the spinal injections and the um, trigger point injections and all the stuff to try and get me some relief. And then last year, I started having severe weakness in my left leg and my left arm, um, and it started moving over to the right. And then I got numbness in my midsection, like a transverse myelitis. Um, couldn't feel any of the skin. It was kind of feeling like, like that hug feeling that they talk about with MS and stuff, but yeah. still no bands, none of that stuff. But now in 2022, I have elevated myelin proteins that are way high. Um, I have a, a brain lesion, significant brain lesion. Um, I have developed nystagmus and a tremor and the nerve conduction study EMG showed nerve damage and weakness. Um, just all these different things. I did not test positive for the aquaporin four or the MOAGs, so they weren't sure what to do with me. But now here I am. <laughs> they just kept dosing me with steroids and gabapentin and saying, you'll be okay. <laughs> Right. So what was that like in trying to figure out the treatment protocols that had to be the way to that had to be incredible? Well, it was very frustrating. And I even had one doctor tell me, um, maybe we just need to send you to psychiatry. And it broke my heart. I mean, that hurt. Like I work with these people. They should know me better, <laughs> you know? And so I was, that hurt. And that made me start questioning everything I was dealing with. Like, okay, maybe I am losing it. And it's all just in my head. And I'm imagining this stuff. And maybe it's not real. And, you know, maybe it's something else. Um, the MRIs showed like a, a couple of like, a little bit of osteophytes on one disc and a little bit of bulging on another disc, but nothing significant. So it's like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm just being oversensitive. And I started just feeling, uh, it was a horrible feeling. It was so depressing and scary. And I beat myself up for a long time, just thinking I'm just getting old and I'm a wimp and I can't handle it. It was awful. It's sad to find out how common medical gaslighting is. Um, I, I hear about it all the time. So many people are told that it's in their heads or they're suspected of being drug seekers. You know. Yeah. And they want you to fit into a tidy little box. An NMO does not fit in a tidy little box. Exactly. <laughs> it is so very interesting. <laughs> well, and they, one of the other problems, I'm a very bubbly, happy, outgoing person all the time. I don't care how much I'm hurting. I'm just, I'm a bubbly person. I always have a smile on my face. So I don't know that they really believed that I was struggling as much as I was. You don't look sick, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. In, re in regard to, to treatment, you said they've been treating mostly symptoms. So do you take a preventative? Well, I do now. So when neurology was not taking me seriously, my sister-in-law also works in this building. It's a huge practice. She also works here. And so she came over to the rheumatologist and said, is there any way you guys could work my sister in line? She's got all sorts of issues. We can't figure out what's going on with her. Can you help her? And so, and I had actually discovered NMO, um, like just through research, we have access to the Mayo Clinic and some other medical, you know, big time thingies here. I don't Google MD. I don't any of the, you know, none of that stuff. No Google Docs. Um, right, you're talking reliable resources. Yes. And I did some research. And so when I came to um, Dr. Lardy, I said, you know, everybody keeps telling me, sure looks like you have MS. Sure looks like you have MS. The guy that does the um, spinal injections. And the neurosurgeon in one of the halls down here said it. And my eye doctor kept saying it. I said, but neurology keeps telling me it's not. I said, so I've been kind of looking at some things that mimic MS, but aren't MS. And so I, I was talking to him about some of them. And um, he's like, you know, I, I see where you're going. He says, but that's so rare. He says, I, I just, we're not going to go there. So let's, let's test for some rheumatology things. And like 27 vials of blood later, <laughs> more testing. <laughs> he sits me down and he says, so remember when we had that discussion and I told you I didn't think it was NMO because it's such a rare thing? He said, yeah, I consulted with one of my colleagues and he said, yeah, 
your NMO. And so he sent me, at that point, I um, was starting to have difficulty walking because of the weakness. My leg feels like it's going to go out from underneath me. Um, can't feel my feet. And my arm's very weak. So uh, he sent me for plasmapheresis. Now, I was just coming off of an extremely high-dose steroid course, which is why I'm so round right now. I'm not this fat normally. <laughs> um, but it was like 60 milligrams of pet prednisone every day. And then it went to 50 for 10 days. And then, you know, taper down. But a lot of steroids. So when I finished that, um, he let my body rest for just a little while and then sent me for plasmapheresis. So I did five rounds of plasmapheresis, body rested a little while, and then we started Truxima. Um, my insurance wouldn't pay for Rituxin, but they pay for the biosimilar. Of course, I had to get a, um, a patient assistance grant to cover my copay of $7,000 in infusion. Ouch. Right. Yeah. But so now I just finished the Truxima infusions. So that's, that's what we're going with now. And we're going to evaluate, see if I, if he, we're just going to watch because I work with him. So we're going to watch and see how I'm doing and to decide whether I'm going to do it on a six month regimen or a year long regimen, depending on how I do. That's quite the journey. Yeah. It took eight years to get a diagnosis and treatment. That's a shame. So my, my current physician that came up with the diagnosis first of all, I was very angry that it happened the way it did, um, was determined to figure it out. And then his concern is that because it went untreated so long that some of the stuff going on is just going to be permanent, you know, like, right. don't know if we're going to bounce back from this one. So I use a cane now and 40% visual, visual field damage and colorblind in my left eye. So. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear all this. Your experiences are not all that Unsimilar. Not that that makes it better, but it definitely goes to show that we have a lot of work to do. When I joined the, the Devix disease website that um, Samara Foundation did mm -hmm. the double center negative off of, yeah. um, I joined that because I thought, okay, am I just being hypersensitive? Am I really imagining these things? What's going on? And when I joined that group, I discovered we're all kind of doing the same thing. And, Exactly. different variations but we're all doing the same thing there is comfort in that it's strange but there's comfort in that oh absolutely and i think that's the power of community having a diagnosis and more so finding a community of people who had those shared experiences it's yeah. very validating you know you're not crazy <laughs> you know you're not some medical anomaly to be able to kind of find your tribe they say yes <laughs> Yep. By the time I got the diagnosis, when I came to see Lowry, I said, I, at that point, I don't care what you call it. I don't care. I don't care what name you put on it. I don't care if you don't give it a name. Just fix me. I don't care. Make me feel better. <laughs> call it whatever you want. <laughs> you just get to that point. Like, I just, I want to feel normal again, you know? Right. Well, hopefully the establishment of this community um, and bring everyone together and finding the people out there that are double zero negative gives us an opportunity to start having that discussion on a grander scale. Yeah. And start digging into the science and finding the answers and getting it recognized so that there are no doubts of patients who aren't fitting into the little boxes. Right. So having this community and get, getting this these voices together um, is definitely going to be the first step and hopefully we can, we can change things very soon. I'm hoping there is an antibody for us that they just haven't discovered yet and they will discover it and we'll have targeted treatment. <laughs> As we learn more about NMO and now MOG, we're taking that leap forward and finding what is next and the next evolution of that science is going to help us nail down what it is. Right. And unfortunately, Putting a, a more formal name to it is going to be the only way to, to get people to, to step up and, and get the results for the patients. You know, well, everyone's trying to figure it out. We're still trying to live with things. Right. <laughs> like you said, call it what you want, but treat me, fix me. Yeah, anything. I don't care what you call it. Call it Bob's disease. I don't care. Just fix it. <laughs> 
Exactly right. Exactly right. Next, we're joined by Dr. Sarah Mariotto of the University of Verona. She focuses on NMO and MOG and the analysis of novel biomarkers. She's also part of the International Clinical Consortium for the Study of NMOSD and the Neuroimmunology Board of the European Academy of Neurology. Exactly what is double seronegative NMOSD? So uh, double seronegative NMOSD up to the latest diagnostic criteria is a subgroup of NMOSD where we are not uh, able to find out uh, any specific antibodies. So we are not able to find aquaporin-4 antibodies. Um, and of course, we are not able also to find MOG antibodies because in the la latest case, it should be MOG. So double seronegative NMOSD is a condition very similar from a clinical and radiological point of view of to NMOSD, but where we are not able to find any kind of antibody. In terms of presentation and the signs and symptoms, is there any difference between how it presents with that of NMO and MOG? So, um, well, of course, um, when you use some criteria to define a disease, then uh, these criteria actually define the disease. So this means that uh, if we want to say what's NMOSD according to the latest criteria, we have to say that uh, it's, um, it's very similar to um, seropositive, aquaporin-4 seropositive NMOSD. Although, we, as I said, we do not find aquaporin-4 antibodies, but the clinical presentation and radiological features are very similar. So once again, optic neuritis, uh, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, uh, or brainstem area plus post-trauma syndromes. So something which from the clinical and also radiological point of view has to be very, very similar to seropositive NMOSD. And actually, to be defined seronegative NMOSD, patients has to satisfy specific radiological and clinical criteria, which are very strict because we do not find antibodies. So we have to be sure that even if we do not find them, um, the clinical presentation is very similar to seropositive NMOSD. So from the clinical and radiological point of view, this is course, it's very similar. The only difference, well, let's say the main difference is that we do not find any antibody. Essentially, it's a population of people who have tested negative for AQP4 and MOG antibodies. Now, I've heard you talk about improving diagnostics can help reduce the number of double zero negative cases. How does that work? So, um, as you correctly say, so we have to be sure that the patient is negative for both aquaporin-4 antibodies and MOG antibodies. So, but we have, of course, different assay to analyze both these antibodies. So let's talk, for example, about aquaporin-4. Um, when aquaporin-4 antibodies are present, they are always present uh, in serum. So it's correct if we test the serum of patients. There are only rare cases where reported where patients has, have CSF only aquaporin-4 antibodies. But it's quite clear in literature now that if you want to test aquaporin-4 antibodies, then you have to test them in the serum of patients. But um, there are essentially, well, there are different assays that you can use to test aquaporin-4 antibodies, and each of these has different sensitivity and specificity. Um, there is quite agreement that uh, the fixed CBA is good to detect MOG antibodies, sorry, aquaporin-4 antibodies, but um, the live CBA, which is a little bit more difficult to perform and require more expertise, can add a little bit of sensitivity and specificity. So this is for an example on how changing the assay, you change the sensitivity and specificity of the test. In some labs, well, now we usually, all of us use the cell-based assay, but once, for example, um, also in our lab, we use the immunohistochemistry to detect aquaporin-4 antibodies, which is less sensitive and specific in comparison to the cell-based assay. So just to say that it's important to choose the correct matrix, which is a serum, but also the best assay. This is mentioned also in the diagnostic criteria. And the second point is that you have to test the antibodies in the right moment. For example, if you test the aquaporin anti for antibodies, this is even more true for MOG antibodies. Without, when, when the patient is stable with no relapses or after, for example, plasma exchange, then there can be a little chance of being negative, although you should be positive, but the treatments just decrease or under the threshold of the positivity of the antibodies. So it's very much important to test the antibodies in the right matrix with the right assay 
and in the right moment. So in the acute stage before treatment. This is for aquaporin-4. As for MUG, we recently reported some data that testing CSF in addition to serum can increase diagnostic sensitivity. So for example, if you test only serum and you have a serum negative and MOSD, you could have the MOG antibodies in the CSF only, which means that these patients has MOGAD and not seronegative NMOSD. This is true also for the diagnostic criteria of MOGAD, the novel ones. Um, and also for MOG, it's important that you use the correct assay, which for MOG, the more, more sensitive and specific is, is the live cell-based assay. Also the fixed cell-based assay is available, but we know that the live one is a little bit, well, let's say it's a bit, more specific and sensitive. So, and then there are other assays like ELISA Western blot, which can't be used to detect mock antibodies because they alter the conformation of the protein. And once again, if you test the antibodies in absence of relapses without an acute stage or after treatment, they can be negative. So once again, test them with a live CBA if possible, or if we fixed, but the fi if the fix is negative, then, and you have a high suspicion, then it's good to, to test uh, serum and CSF also with the live. If the serum is negative, then you, and the suspicion is high, then you can test also the CSF and pay attention to the moment when you're testing the antibodies. So that's why you have to take into account all these things before defining a patient seronegative. That's a lot of moving targets. It really gives me a, a new appreciation for the testing process. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about treatments? Are there specific treatment modalities or considerations for treating seronegative patients? Well, so uh, the main problem is that uh, seronegative patients are rare, and usually they're, they're not so rep well represented into clinical trials, which is one of the main problems, because when uh, uh, the novel drugs are approved, usually they are approved for patients with aquaporin-4 seropositive NMOSD. It's not because they do not work. It's just because you do not, do not have enough patients to say something about seronegative NMOSD. So up to now, you define NMOSD independently on uh, the presence or not of aquaporin-4 antibodies. I mean, if you satisfy the criteria for seronegative NMOSD, then you, in any case, you have NMOSD. Of course, from a rational and pathogenic point of view, uh, you have to think that maybe you do not have any antibody there, or maybe you have other antibodies. So all the targets, uh, specific targets of antibodies can work or not for patients who are seronegative, just because you, don't, you do not know. If you don't, do not find the antibodies, it doesn't mean that uh, there are no antibodies. Maybe you're not, we are not able to find them, or maybe there are some other antibodies, we don't know. But the point is that we really do not know. And the second limitation is this one. So we have really few data on treatment response to seronegative NMOSD because the patients are very few. And so this is the main limitation, I think, for on, of clinical trials related to, to NMOSD, that it's difficult to approve some drugs for patients with seronegative NMOSD because of the numbers, which is, of course, a, a problem that we should take into account. Do we have any idea of exactly how many patients fall into the, to the category of double serial negative? Well, about, uh, it's usually they say like uh, five to 10% of patients with NMOSD, but of course it strongly depends on, uh, on, the, on how you test them, of course, um, and how you're very strict to apply the criteria. We recently did a study on seronegative NMOSD and we asked uh, some colleagues to send us patients with seronegative NMOSD. And what we saw was that uh, some of these patients didn't satisfy precisely the criteria of seronegative NMOSD. So it's very much important that uh, we know what we are talking about. So if we are talking about seronegative NMOSD, these patients has to satisfy the diagnostic criteria. Sometimes we say, well, it's seronegative NMOSD, although it, it, it clinically, from the clinical point of view, it's very similar, but actually doesn't fit the criteria. These should not be seronegative NMOSD because we should talk about it only if this satisfies precisely the diagnostic criteria from, I mean, from a clinical point of view, of course. Then there are also cases with a similar clinical syndromes and radiological features, which looks like NMOSD, but do not satisfy the criteria. But this is another problem because uh, it's very important to be strict with the assays and the criteria to be sure about what we are talking about. 
Yeah, making sure everyone's defining the problem the same is important, and that kind of leads to the next question. Um, the diagnostic guidelines for NMO are about 10 years old, and the discussion about updating them has started. Now, we've had great strides in our understanding of the disease since they were originally published, but some have wondered if double seronegative NMO originally would be a part of that or not. Can you share any insight on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, well, what we, what it's true is that uh, there will be an update of the criteria because, of course, uh, there are so many novelties in these days, like uh, MOG antibodies, the MOGAT criteria, the novel biomarkers. So I think, uh, uh, well, from my point of view, that it's very much important to update the criteria. And, of course, uh, how to define uh, and where to put seronegative animal disease is, very, is a very much important point. Um, well, but I think that uh, rather to put them out from NMOSD, which is something which, of course, uh, um, it's difficult to think for all patients who are diagnosed with NMOSD. Um, I think that the focus should be um, to try to understand what's there. So which antibodies, which biomarker, um, to better define these patients, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, in the last year, there has been a big discussion on what is seronegative NMOSD and where to put it. Uh, and from my point of view, it's a good idea to include them in, uh, in uh, within the big uh, definition of NMOSD, but uh, there should be also um, a big attention to try to better define them. Um, from a biological, clinical, radiological, and treatment point of view, because these patients exist, of course, they could be different, um, but they need to um, to be part of a disease and they need to know what to do and what's going on in their condition. Who decides the diagnostic criteria like that? Like, How do they reach consensus? Well, uh, so usually a process uh, is based on um, expert clinicians and researchers in the field, um, which discuss about uh, the main topic of, uh, of the condition uh, or all together or in subgroups uh, according to their specific expertise. And, uh, and of course, according to literature data, because it's not only a personal view, it's also, of course, based on what has been published and what has been told. Um, and then they try to reach a consensus about uh, different topics, which is, of course, not only um, how to define the disease, but also which are the main clinical points, main radiological features, uh, where, how we should test the antibodies, um, which biomarkers could be useful. So it's um, a big discussion on different uh, subtopics related to, to the disease by a panel of experts who try to, to define as, as better as, as is possible um, uh, the, the specific disorder. What would it mean if it was separated out from the diagnostic guidelines? Well, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it's, uh, it's a good idea to think about that because I, I'm also not sure that... Uh, uh, this will happen, so um, uh -huh. it would be good to discuss before before that. Of course, whenever you remove someone from a category, then you should uh, decide where to put it. So it can't be that you just put out some patients uh, and then uh, th that's all. You have also to define where this patient should be put in. That's why I was sp speaking about MOGAD, because, for example, I'm strictly convinced that, but it's also describing literature, that a significant percentages of seronegative NMOSD now we, that we know about MOG antibodies are defined within, within the MOGAD criteria. So I think that the good point is uh, um, to, to try to work more on the definition. So to try to find out something there, because whenever you find novel antibodies, novel biomarkers, then uh, although maybe these patients are no more part of an MOSD, but maybe they can be part of another condition. So many of them just moved after the detection of MOG antibodies from NMOSD to MOGAD, which is not good nor worse. But anyway, I think that it's good to know where you are. And uh, also because you know which condition you have, so which is the prognosis, which are the best treatment. So I think it was a good point for all patients with seronegative NMOSD, which moved to the proper condition. So I think that the community sh should work a lot on seronegative NMSD, but especially in trying to put it in the right category.
which can be for someone an MOSD, for other MOGAD, or for other maybe something else that we do not know yet. So would there be guidelines developed for double zero negative? Yeah, I don't think that, uh, from, I mean, this is of course my point of view, but uh, I don't think that you can just take a disease and put it out and forget it. Um, uh, the criteria, I mean, the, the latest one has been fought to um, include within the seronegative criteria patients with a very strict clinical and radiological pictures, very, very similar to that of seropositive NMOSD. It's very difficult to satisfy the criteria because they were really strict. So you don't need only a correct clinical phenotype, but also you need also a proper radiological phenotype. Uh, and so I think that they were designed to try to catch up all that patients uh, with a high suspicion of being an MSD, but where you couldn't find the antibodies. So you can't, I don't think that you can simply forget them and then just say, well, they do not exist because we know they exist. There are not so many, but they are there. So um, I don't think that, uh, that that can happen simply that patients are, are just uh, put somewhere else uh, and that's all and we forget about it. Uh, I, I think that there will be a solution which can be whatever, but the, the, the best solution would be um, to put them in the proper category, like uh, as I mentioned before, has been done on, for some of them or for MOGAD. So um, that's why I think we should, we really need some more research dedicated to patients with seronegative NMOSD. I mean, I understand that it's a rare disease and a subgroup of a rare disease. So of course, uh, there are many different conditions which are more common, but I'm very passionate about seronegative NMOSD. I think it's very fascinating because it's something where we have to, there is something that we do not know. So we have to put all our attention in trying to discover what's there. I think that uh, for some of them, for sure, there are some antibodies that we do not know. And anyway, even if we are not able to find the antibodies, uh, it's a good idea to work on biomarkers to try to define um, what's, what's going on. So I think it's very fascinating, especially because we do not know many things about it. Uh, and we, of course, should not stop working on that. And I don't think that this will change. I, I, it's just a con try to understand uh, how to define it, where to put it, uh, but I don't think that the research should stop on that. It's a, it's a very fascinating and very important topic to work on. We've seen MS patients be re-diagnosed with NMO and then NMO patients who were found to have MOG. It makes sense that as the science is being redefined and new biomarkers and antibodies are being discovered that we're able to provide more accurate diagnoses for patients. Now, before you stress the importance of research and clinical trials for double zero negative, um, are there other studies or research that's actively going on that you're aware of or that you can speak about? Yeah, so, well, for example, we just, we try to study some biomarkers uh, like uh, neurofilament light chain, the change, chain GFAP, as you probably know, and you have heard about these biomarkers because they have been mentioned a lot uh, in relation to seropositive NMOSD, like NFL is a marker of axonal damage, GFAP is a marker of astroglial damage, um, and there have been quite a lot of studies dedicated to these biomarkers as a possible um, marker of disease activity in uh, different conditions, including NMOSD. So what we did was to try to compare the levels of this biomarker for a multicenter study. Multicenter, because as, as we know, it's a rare disease, so it was not easy to, um, to include uh, enough patients to do a good uh, statistical work. So we try to measure these biomarkers in the serum of patients with seropositive NMOSD and seronegative NMOSD to see what's going on there and what happened. And it was quite fascinating because we saw that um, the marker of axonal damage, NFL, is very similar in the two conditions, while the marker of astroglial damage is usually increased in seropositive patients, which fits because aquaporin-4 target glia and, uh, and it makes sense to see that there is an astroglial damage. Um, so it seems that there, there is like kind of different target in the two conditions. But another nice thing that we saw was that a couple of patients with seronegative NMOSD, and we were sure that they were seronegative because they've been tested in two labs with the live CBA. They were also negative for MOG, so they were true seronegative. And we also checked they fit the criteria. Uh, these two had increased GFAP levels. 
as if there was a kind of um, uh, something, I don't know if an antibody or something, which target astroglial also in these two patients. So it's, it's like, uh, well, it's a kind of different condition according to the biomarker profile, um, but in some of these cases, there can be an astroglial damage that we should uh, try to better understand. And now our idea is to try to collect more patients with increased GFAP levels and seronegative NMSD, and to try to identify the target um, of these patients. I think this is a good step to try to define something more and to try to understand something more about this condition. Any final thoughts or key takeaways? The, the important thing is to, to know something as what we already mentioned it about the assay that we should use um, to know that there is a research and science going on. So you are not left alone. We are very passionate and working on that. Um, it's also important to, um, I think, to refer to the right physicians because as in all rare disease, not all neurologists in all the world are very much expert about that. So it's very important to, um, to know who, where, when, so to know who you're referring to. And um, because of course it's not easy as I mentioned, sometimes uh, uh, the idea is that, well, these patients fit the criteria, I did everything, but maybe that was not the case. So it's very important to, um, to go to the right uh, doctors uh, which are expert on the field. And uh, then to know, and also it's very much important to know that we are still working a lot on that um, from many different points of view. And, uh, and hopefully there will be also more, more founding dedicated to these dis disorders because whatever we do, of course we do it uh, with kind of support and with all our passion. And uh, that there is a lot of work on that. And for example, I mentioned what we are going to do. Um, and it's also important in this disease to collaborate because the disease is rare. But I have to say that there is a good collaboration between centers on this condition. So whenever we propose something is usually very much appreciated from other centers to collect zebra, collect the data. Um, so the community is working a lot on that. So um, and this is uh, just what I have to say to, yeah, to make you confident that uh, we are trying to do our best to, to, to better define this disease. And I think that's a really important point that you made about finding the right doctor because the the rare nature of this and that the community of clinicians is is growing and developing as, as everyone's learning more. Any advice to a patient on making that right connection and finding the doctor who would be right to treat them? Yeah, so of course, it's very much related to the country or where the patient lives. But uh, um, of course, uh, all neurologists should know about all diseases, but uh, neurology is a very big uh, field. So as, as I, of course, I'm not expert about many other things, and I, I usually refer patients with other conditions to the right, doc right doc doctor. Of course, it's, it's good for a first screening, just a general good neurologist. But I think that there is a, like there are websites, uh, there are different things, uh, different patients associations, and also website of patients association with many physicians uh, uh, being into the into the board. These are all all very much passionate and expert about the disease. Many ambassadors, and I think that uh, this could be a good uh, way to obtain a second opinion, uh, very specific of someone who is very dedicated to this disease. I mean. And we are not all expert about everything um, because it's not easy, of course, as uh, whatever we are doing in life. Um, but yeah, I think that in this case, uh, since it's very much difficult from different point of view, it's good to refer to a different doc to a doctor who is specifically dedicated to this and also to a lab for the antibody testing, which is dedicated to these conditions, because there is always, as I mentioned, testing CSF, doing the live assay, um, I don't know, expanding the antibodies assay with immunohistochemistry, um, work on the biomarkers. There is always something more that we can do. And, but of course it's done in specific dedicated lab, not, not in old ones. So, I think that also patients associations are doing a good work on that, trying to promote uh, uh, centers which are dedicated to these conditions and try to do something more than the general things. 
For the final segment, we're going to be joined by Samira Ahmed, founder of the Samira Foundation, who is also double Sierra negative. Samira, thank you for coming on the show. Let's start, if you could, with your experiences living in that gray space of being diagnosed with double Sierra negative NMO. Yeah, so I would say uh, one of the most critical moments, I think, in a rare disease patient's life, or maybe any anyone who's been diagnosed with anything is the first time that you hear, you know, the name of your diagnosis. And of course, neuromyelitis optica uh, doesn't sound not serious. So on top of hearing, you know, as Myra, we, we suspect that you have something called neuromyelitis optica. There was this additional word that came in front of it, which was seronegative. And at the time, you know, I was 25. I had just been in the workforce for a few years in healthcare, but I had never heard either of these words before. So it was so overwhelming. And then on top of being diagnosed, you you also understand that you're a part of this rare group within a rare group. And so your mind spirals. And I think being seronegative you know, you, you, you wonder, is this real? Is this a figment of my imagination? And, you know, if there's no biomarker, maybe this isn't, you know, what they're saying it is. So I think the dangers of hearing or, or knowing that you're seronegative and living in seronegative is that your mind explores all kinds of avenues. Whereas, you know, if I was told concretely, hey, you're aquaporin for positive, we found this antibody. This is what this means. There's no room for questioning, right? You're like, okay, I have this. You know, I feel like the acceptance process maybe happens quicker or it might come easier, although it's never easy. But at least you know that there is something that's saying for sure you have this. So yeah, I mean, you know, as you said, it's, it's you're kind of in this gray area. You're in limbo. You're in this like no man's land because you wonder if I don't have the biomarker, is this real? What kind of challenges have you experienced? Oh, yeah, a lot. Um, the first I can say, you know, is what I just talked about, a bit of an identity crisis because I didn't really know where to go. What does this mean for me? Like, am I an NMO patient? Am I not an NMO patient? So, you know, um, being able to identify with something was challenging. And, you know, it, it still is nine years later. But furthermore, um, getting access to therapies, especially after these FDA approved therapies for aquaporin 4 positive patients came out, even though, you know, in all of my records for almost a decade, it says that I, I do in fact have neuromyelitis optica, getting insurance to cover medication for NMOSD, it never comes without a fight. And that fight yeah usually causes a lot of stress and agony, which flares up my symptoms even more. So of course, you know, therapy, access and therapies is a huge challenge with seronegative patients. Recently, TSF has been doing a lot of work with establishing the double seronegative NMO community and resources. Can you talk about some of that for us? Absolutely. Um, so obviously, whatever I do with the foundation, uh, I believe comes from my heart and I, I try to listen and learn from the community and, and do things based on that. But um, this particular focus with, you know, seronegative NMOSD has become a bit of a personal project for me, obviously, because I myself am, you know, seronegative NMOSD, but also because I know for a fact that there are so many others like me and we don't, we all kind of feel the same way. Like, where, where are we going? What are, what do we have? What's going to happen to us, et cetera, et cetera. So from the foundation's perspective, what have we done? The first thing is we recently um, did a webinar with Dr. Owen Flanagan, who is a top key opinion leader of NMOSD and MOGAD in the world. Uh, he, he works out of uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester. We did a webinar with him this past spring um, fully dedicated to uh, seronegative NMOSD. And it was, he was able to provide such a wealth of knowledge, not just on seronegative NMOSD, but what, what's going on behind the scenes in terms of research. Um, what do we have to look forward to? So if you haven't yet seen that webinar, I, I highly recommend you go watch it. It is on our YouTube channel and on our website. 
Um, but then after that, I thought to myself, hey, wouldn't it be nice if there was a group just for us so that we could talk about things that only we understand as double seronegative patients? So I created a private Facebook group. And in a period of, I want to say two weeks, I was able to find 150 patients around the world who are double seronegative. And that number seems small to most people, but in a rare disease, uh, this is quite a large number in a short period of time. And I suspect that there are many other patients out there who I have not yet found, or maybe they don't have social media, but I think this is a good start. And then of course, this podcast episode, you know, which uh, of course includes Dr. Sara Mariotto, who is a, another key opinion leader, and then Nicole, uh, another patient. So I think what we're doing to raise awareness and share stories of double seronegative patients um, is a great start in really understanding what's going on with us. We're also doing a push on sharing more stories via Voices of NMO um, and sharing more stories about these patients and what their experiences have been like so that we can learn from them and also see what can we do to make all of our lives easier with without a biomarker. I know even as a, a MOG patient, I watched the webinar with Dr. Flanagan and I learned a ton from it. And it really informed me even more about my disease, just listening to him talk about his experiences and the research and the nature of double seronegative. And when I was talking to Dr. Mariota, um, it was interesting to hear that she estimates between five to 10% of what we consider the NMO population is double zero negative. So I was mm -hmm. really surprised to see that the community is potentially that that large when you look at the access to testing. So there are probably a number of patients that are out there having symptoms that have never been tested for, for either antibody. Mm -hmm. And we just haven't been able to, to find them yet, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. Without access to testing comes access to medication. Exactly. Which leads me to the next point that advocacy is so important for rare diseases in general. What can patients and caregivers and even clinicians do in that arena? I think we just need to keep speaking up and reminding people that, especially decision makers and insurance companies and folks who are uh, you know, developing guidelines or whatever, I think we need to keep reminding them that we also exist, that we're also you know, struggling and have all these symptoms. Um, and have all of these challenges because my biggest worry is that we're gonna be forgotten. And there's, yeah, you know, Brian, I go to all these conferences now, which is great. I'm not really a science kind of gal, but I'm trying to learn <laughs> the science. And one thing I see for sure, you know, over the last four or five years at these, you know, webinars, conferences, podcasts, Everyone for a while was talking about aquaporin-4 positive. Of course, that's great. And now it's like you, you turn your head and it's MOGAD, 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 and that's wonderful. But I feel that nobody's talking about seronegative anemosy, and that makes me really nervous. I worry about the future of our patients. Um, I can tell you this is something that I only recently talked about publicly, started talking about publicly, was that you know, there was a period of time where I was failing so many therapies. Um, and because I didn't have a positive antibody for anything out of maybe defiance and frustration and aggravation, I decided to go off all my meds a few years ago because I was so angry at everyone, at the world, at my disease, yeah. at my body. And, uh, Lo and behold, I had the worst relapse of my life. And of course, after that, I learned, okay, even though I don't have a biomarker that's been yet identified, something's clearly going on and I need to be on meds. But I'm, I know that I'm not the only patient that's you know gone down that path. It's a very dangerous path. And I think part of that is because of what I said earlier, we just don't know. And that that level of uncertainty with terrible symptoms is a really tough combination to live with on a daily basis. Right. So I think that patients and caregivers keep, keep sharing your stories, never stop advocating for yourself, 
Don't stop asking questions. You're never annoying. There's no such thing as a stupid question, but we need to make sure that, um, you know, that our stories are heard and that they land on the right people. And uh, for the clinicians and researchers, uh, whatever we can do as patients to support your research efforts in finding our biomarker, uh, let's keep that channel of communication open. I know just from running this group now of a couple scores of patients, we're able and willing to do whatever we can to find our biomarker. So we're here and we're ready to uh, find it. Well, Samara, thank you for joining us today. Um, really appreciate you taking your time. Appreciate you finding the people and building our community and now giving voice to the double zero and negative patients that are out there and illuminating the darkness for all of us. <laughs> thank you, it's my pleasure. Thank you again to all of our guests. I'm grateful for their time. And I wanna close out the episode with some final thoughts from Nicole Helton. I see things from both sides because I'm a medical professional, but I'm also a patient. So for the patients, I always tell people, be your own advocate. Just continue to be your own advocate. You know your body better than anybody else does. Be your own advocate and don't give up. Because for about a year, I gave up. And I was just like, whatever. I guess it's all in my head. I'm just going to live with it and push through. Um, and then this last flare-up that I had knocked me for a loop. And I'm like, you know what? Come on, figure this out. <laughs> Let's get busy. So be your own advocate. But for the medical professionals, just take your patients seriously. Take them seriously. Not everybody is drug seeking and psychotic. Take them seriously. We know, I, I don't know. I feel like because we don't fit in this perfect little box that we get brushed off and ignored. Well, you don't have this O-band or you don't have this, you know, aquaporin four. So go on, you don't belong to me. Next you just get kind of cast aside. It's just, it's very frustrating.